In this video, I'm going to show you how to tan animal hides using tree bark to make this nice, supple leather. This will work with about any fur or any dehaired hide as well. If you have an interest in primitive or traditional skills, you've probably heard of a few different kinds of making leather from animal hides. I think brain tanning is generally the most well heard of because it sounds so strange. And that was a very common method here in North America. But around the rest of the world, more often than not, animal hides were tanned using tree bark. That tree bark colors the flesh of the hide, it softens it for you, and compounds in the bark called tannins actually bond to the collagen fibers within the hide. Tannins bind up proteins. That's actually where the word tanning comes from. You tan hides using tannins. Much modern leather is still tanned this way, mostly from bark extract from oak and a couple other trees like mimosa. Different barks will give you different kinds of leathers. And bark preserves leather so well that you could bury this in the ground and dig it up a year later and it'd be somewhat intact still. It cleans it and makes it smell amazing too. I use willow to tan my fur pelts. Since I raise meat rabbits, there's never a shortage of furs around here. So when I skin a rabbit and flesh the hide, I then tack it out to dry. It ends up like this. Papery. And this is just raw hide at this point. You can take any hide, scrape the fat and the flesh off, and then let it dry, and then you have raw hide, and it's shelf stable for years. You just gotta keep it away from insects, and direct sunlight will deteriorate it as well. But stored in a dark place, it'll be good for a very long time. And that same papery hide turns into this nice, supple, thicker leather, because tannins actually strengthen the hide structure. If you don't want the deep dive into the methodology of what we're doing, and you just want to see the hides get tanned, you can go ahead and skip ahead. I'll have some numbers on the screen so you know where to go. But if you want to learn how to do this and what to avoid, and, you know, the nuances of this craft, then please keep watching. Now as I film this video, it's trapping season, and I've been trapping lots of muskrats. Dry muskrat hides look kind of funny, but their fur is actually so dense and so supple that it's actually of higher quality than my rabbit hides. Got some willow logs here. This is a variety of willow that grows a really tall, mini-trunked shrub. I'm not sure of the species. It seems a lot similar to coyote willow, which is Salix exigua. One of the ways I identify this species is it's very prone to a kind of midge that will lay its eggs in the bark of the plant. When the larvae hatch, it grows a gall off the ends of the branches. It looks like a pine cone growing on a willow tree. This species is particularly prone to those galls, and my theory is that it has developed a lot of tannins as a natural defense against those midges because it's the species most parasitized by them. But either way, this variety is really good for tanning. Not every variety is great for tanning. There's a way to tell um, if the tree you have will be good for tanning or not. And if you peel the bark, I'll do this in a moment here, you can actually chew on the bark and if it dries out your mouth, that's the tannins acting. It leaves this dry sensation even though your mouth isn't dry. It just makes it feel that way tightens up that uh, that skin because it bonds to the proteins of your tongue and gums. So if you can chew on a bit of bark and it immediately dries out your mouth, leaves that dry feeling even after you spit out the bitter bark, then that's a good bark for tanning. So that's how I weed out different species of willow. Now that's not to be confused with bitterness. Many willow varieties are very bitter in the bark and that bitterness is great as a painkiller because that is generally salicylic acid you're tasting, but that's different than the tannins that dry your mouth. So you need to be able to tell the difference between the two. I find some species that are very bitter, but not drying at all. And that drying sensation is called astringent. So I'll refer to it as that for the rest of the video. So few people actually bark tan anymore. It's kind of more of a lost art than brain tanning is, it seems. Another telltale sign of tannins is oxidization after you peel bark. You can see this is kind of a pinkish hue on the edges. That's going to turn much dark colored given enough time. It'll turn brown. With alder it's extreme and um, you can peel alder bark and it will oxidize within minutes. You can actually watch it go from tan to brown on that tree trunk. But you can peel a bit of bark, get some of that inner bark, and just chew it. You can pull off a piece and that drying sensation hits after a couple seconds. The more you chew, the more of it you'll get. And so you can try different varieties of willow or other trees like oaks and gauge how much tannins are in them and choose the best species accordingly. So I'm going to peel all these logs and chop up the bark and I'll show you how to make an extract so that you can actually tan your hides. One really nice thing about bark tanning is unlike brain tanning, you don't need to be perfect about getting the membrane 
off of the animal skin. With muskrats, for instance, you want to dry them with the membrane on because their skin is so thin and it fuses so much with the membrane that it's really hard to distinguish them. And for commercial tanneries, they want the membrane on because it thickens that skin and makes a stronger leather. Bark tanning is pretty similar to that. With muskrats, you want to leave that membrane on and it'll come off or loosen up in the tan, as you'll see. Hey, real quick, this is a week after I filmed this video and those muskrat hides have not really tanned out very well. Turns out I left too much of the membrane on. What I should have done is put them into the tan, then after the first day, brought them back to the fleshing beam and scraped some of that membrane off. The tanning solution allows that membrane to come off much more easily, but if you, if you leave it in too long, the membrane will absorb all your tannins, which is what happens in this video. Uh, so after a week of tanning, I scraped off the membrane and uh, the skin underneath was still untanned. So uh, bottom line, scrape your muskrat skins after they've been in the tan for a day and continue to scrape them each day if they're not tanning well. That'll really help it. A draw knife is a really handy tool for this. In a pinch, you can use a normal knife. Right now it's winter, but in spring and summer, you can actually peel the bark off of a willow tree, especially younger bark that's not as rough. You can peel it like banana peels. It makes it really easy. In the winter, it takes a lot more effort. You just gotta collect all that bark, and then you have to chop it somewhat fine. We wanna go for one inch pieces or so when we go to chop it. Then we'll boil it to make our extract. You can often find old draw knives at antique stores. That's where I found this one. Just needed a bit of sharpening and it was good to go. You'll get them much cheaper that way. And really cheap new draw knives generally cost 50 bucks or so. You can get them at Home Depot. They're not good for anything really, except for peeling bark. These older ones are so nice for everything. Really versatile woodworking tool. A shave horse is a really nice tool to have for this. I don't have such a luxury, so for now, we're just using a sawhorse and the old leg vise. It's really important that you get green bark, so you cut live trees or freshly killed trees, because tannins extract with water, and the more it rains on a dead tree, the more of those tannins are going to be stripped out of the bark. But live green trees hold on to their tannins. There's loads of species of trees that are really great for tanning. The channel Skill Colt has an amazing list. Uh, Steve Edholm, I believe is his name. He's got a blog where he lists out loads of trees and plants that work for this. I'll have a few listed on the screen here. In my area, I'm limited to just a couple different species. There's not a lot of hardwood species here, just a handful, and no oaks. Generally speaking, it takes twice as much bark in dry weight as the weight of the hide to tan it and that's a general rule of thumb for instance if you're tanning a deer hide or something that weighs six pounds it will take about 12 pounds of oak bark it might take a little more than that with this willow this willow is highly tannic but i don't think it's quite as high as most oaks so factor that in you can be really analytical about it you can take all these weights and know exactly how much you need or I'd take a more methodical approach and just make my solution by chopping up the bark and filling up the pot with the bark and then adding just enough water to cover all that bark. And then I boil it for an hour and I stir it while it boils, um, just every now and then. After that hour, I let it cool. I strain off that solution and save that. And once it's cool, now there's key. Once it's cool, you can put your hide in it. You can't do that before it's cool or else you'll cook the hide. Basically, make your full strength solution by filling up your pot with chopped bark, add just enough water to cover the top of it, boil it for an hour, strain it, and let it cool, and then add your hide to it, and you'll have to keep an eye on it. And you can boil that same bark again for a second boil to get a little bit more tannin out of it. And I'll give you a solution oftentimes that's about half as strong as your first solution. So uh, if you notice that the tannins are getting depleted in your solution, you can always do that, refresh it. But with many small hides, you might not need to even top it off. But anytime you can find a book on traditional bark tanning, it's well worth having. There's so many ways it was done. There's so many secrets to the trade. You can see here how much bark I've already collected. All I did is I went out to the local river and found the willows. I cut two trunks and then broke them down into five foot sections. It gives me a few pounds of bark. So really the labor is a minimum. Overall, it seems like there's generally less labor. The smell of the finished result, too, is just wonderful. Anything you make from this leather will smell like the forest. 
So this branch up here is dead. You can see that there? See how it's all gone brown? So I'm not going to harvest that. It seems like it's mainly the inner bark with these willows that has the most tannins, at least more than the outer bark. And that varies from tree to tree. Some trees actually have a lot of tannins in their wood, like Osage Orange, for example. So from the chips of that tree itself, you can tan quite a bit. Really great if you're a bow maker. You can save those chips. It'll, it'll probably make a very orange leather. By cutting willow limbs like this, all you're doing is coppicing the tree. You're actually stimulating growth. By cutting those trunks down low to the ground along the river, I actually made it a, a much more valuable tree for beavers. It will grow lots of very tender limbs this spring, um, like hundreds or at least dozens of tender limbs that are very leafy. Those young green shoots are what beavers save up for the winter months. It will actually make stores of twigs to eat through the winter. By cutting this, I've made beaver food. And beavers do the exact same thing. Beavers are nature's perfect coppicing tool. Willow bark is well known for making very soft leather. So it's perfect for my furs. One reason I just love it for rabbit hides is because rabbit hides are so dang thin and so prone to ripping. This tanning method strengthens them more than most other, other tanning methods, especially methods that require a lot of softening, like brain tanning. Here, the bark does most of the softening for you, so you just have to do a small amount of stretching once it's all tanned. Anybody wanting to learn traditional skills or wanting to live off-grid, wanting to live closer to the land, should know bark tanning. You can also saturate bark tan with oil after the fact to help it repel water. So at this point for chopping the bark, I lay out a tarp because it helps collect it all, make sure it doesn't all go flying everywhere. And I just grab my tomahawk, make sure it's nice and sharp, a bit of firewood to chop against, just touch up my axe. In chopping all this, I accidentally hit a rock. This tomahawk is about my most used tool besides my bushcraft knife. I forged it years ago, really a great multi-tool. And this is just a scythe whetstone that I used to sharpen it. One of these days I'll do some blacksmithing content on this channel. All right, I just wanna be careful with this. Aim for one inch pieces. bark fits in one pot. Here we have it. Say hello to the rabbits and get this pot filled up with the spigot here. Hey bunners. <laughs> Just enough to cover it now to boil for an hour. On the side here, I saved a little bit of bark. That way I can add a fair bit of water to this and boil a couple of rusty traps I have because the tannins will react with that rust and create black iron oxide. Make my traps black, make them more invisible. All right, so this pot is just beginning to simmer. It'll often be frothy at first, it has a protein break where all the protein coagulates at the top. It'll foam up a lot and then that foam will go down so you won't have any boiling over after that, or at least, not much, unless it's overfilled. You can see it taking on some color now. So now we just leave it to boil for an hour. Stir it a couple times through the hour. That's all it really seems to take. I got two traps going in this pot. This needs to reach a boil too. It doesn't need nearly as much bark. And it's already starting to change the iron oxide on these traps. But we want a good boil that really speeds up that chemical reaction. Got our traps done here. Look at that, they're just black now. Perfect. A really rusty double spring here. Oh yeah, that is looking good now. Now that that bark solution is finished boiling, we're gonna pour it off into this bucket and let it cool. You don't wanna pour it off into an iron bucket, just so you know. Stainless steel is fine. I'm gonna go ahead and refill this, get a second boil from it, and I'll just add that into this bucket too. That'll just give me more volume to work with. So I got my solution of our first boil here. Last night I put a mink skin I had in it. So we're getting that tan. You can see it's already turning pink and it doesn't feel slick anymore. It feels grippy. That's the tannins doing their work. 
that's how fast it starts working. With a thin skin like this, it could be done in a couple days, could take a week. The important thing is once you get your hides in, you got to keep this somewhat warm. Tanning only occurs between 45 degrees Fahrenheit and about 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Any more and your hide will rot. Any less and it just won't tan. This is how much liquid we got. It's about a gallon, I'd say. That's part of the reason why I got the second boil, just to up the volume. And this will be about half the strength of our first boil. But this will allow me to get a lot more hides in there right now. Get your hides in here. And you're going to want to pull them out and wring them thoroughly every single day. That helps it tan faster. Take a look at that. See how there's a fiber structure on this now? It wasn't like that when it went in. That's because this is partially tanned for now. Once you get your hides in, you're going to want to weigh them down with a stone or something. Don't use a piece of metal. As mentioned earlier, iron's going to react with this solution. For now, I'll just get these muskrat hides in there. It used to be common practice for me to rehydrate the hide before putting it in, but I don't think it actually makes a difference. As they are right now, just totally dry. I'll put them in the solution, and they will rehydrate and start tanning. The trick is, just weigh them down, and stir them up, and wring them out every day. And uh, within a couple days, I bet this solution is going to need to be refreshed. Got a rock, just weigh those down. Keep them under the tannins. Anything above the solution is not going to tan. That's why we weigh it down, and that's why we stir it every day so it all becomes even. You'll still likely notice parts of each hide will tan faster than others. Daily stirring will make sure it evens out. Alright, so I started this batch five days ago, and you can see it's pretty bubbly now. I can see that a lot of this muskrat is just not tanning now, but the mink that I got in a day earlier, this mink has been in there five days. The muskrats have been in there only four days. This mink looks almost finished. There's no spots that really look untanned. And you can also check by pulling a bit of membrane. And even under the membrane, it should still be colored and fibrous. See that? That's looking almost entirely tanned. It could probably use one more day, just to be safe. These thin hides tan so quickly. And to be clear, I've had this bucket in my house so it's warm enough to continue tanning. But you can see the difference there. See that? So clearly, the tannin solution has been depleted, and it needs refreshing. So I collected some more bark. This is starting to ferment quite a bit. It doesn't smell foul or anything. If it does, you definitely don't have enough tannins, because tannins are a preservative. A little fermentation is usual, but given how much fermentation there is, and how much this hide is not tanning through, same with the other muskrat hide, it's time for this batch to be refreshed. Another good thing to look for is any slimy feeling. Like there's parts here that haven't really tanned well that at first feel really slick. That's a good sign that you're not getting that astringency you need. So I went and harvested more bark because just didn't have enough. And I'll just add it all straight to this bucket. Here's my branches to strip bark from. I really thought the bark I had would be enough, so this is a bit of a surprise to me. If I were to leave these hides in this solution, their fur would start slipping. It would start growing mold. Nothing good would come of it. So best to get this refreshed quickly. You can use smaller limbs like this, especially with willow because it grows so many straight shoots. A draw knife in that instance doesn't really make much sense to use. Instead, if you have a good bushcraft knife, that's going to do the job really well. This knife is the official Sage Smoke Survival Bushcraft Knife. It's handmade in North America by a professional bladesmith. It's made from 1084 high carbon steel. It arrives razor sharp. It's easy to sharpen. It can handle every task you throw at it. I use it for everything on a daily basis, processing rabbits and animals I catch on my trap line, carving bows and arrows, scraping bark, starting fires, whatever other bushcraft tasks are needed. This knife really does it all. I hand sharpen them before they ship out. So if you want a great knife and you want to support my channel, check out my website and consider buying a knife. This mink is looking pretty close. Every day you gotta come wring your furs. It does a lot to speed up the tanning process. Just helping to redistribute everything. See how everywhere there was membrane, it's all become this 
stringy, fibrous, leathery stuff. That shows it's working. But you also got these hardly colored, smooth spots. That means our tannin solution was running out. So we got the solution replenished. I'll submerge these two muskrat hides, pin them under a rock. And I'm thinking this mink hide is done. So I'm gonna go ahead and let this dry and we'll see how it's looking. Since you can see the difference between the muskrat pelts and the mink that had an extra day in the solution, you can see how the progression is going to go, especially when I remove some of the fibers from the flesh side, and you can see that underneath it still looks tanned. That's a really good indicator of how far along it's gotten. So with our mink skin now, I've just wrung it out from the solution. We're going to give it a good rinse now. You're not going to wash the bound tannins out of the skin, so you can rinse it really thoroughly. Hell, you can wash it with soap at this point. Then we're going to turn it right side out and get that fur drying. Luckily, today is a very warm day, especially for February. So with all the sunlight, we're just going to hang this up and get it drying. Let's see what we're looking like. We want the first side to dry first. I mean, see how much water that holds. I can stuff most of it into itself here. There we go. Just a few shakes. Starts getting it back through. As I've said before, I've never done this with a mink. So this is an interesting experiment for me. It's that white patch of the chin, all the whiskers, even the eyelids. Yeah, this is going to be just beautiful once it's dry and fluffed up again. Just get her drying out. Well, at this point, you can use a hair dryer or you can just lay it out in the sun. Hang it somewhere from a tree branch or a fence where it can get, where it can get some air. Just keep it away from your dogs if you have one. With my dog, Maverick, here, he, he tends to leave tanned hides alone, but if they're partially tanned, then he'll destroy them. Or if they're rawhide, then it just smells like food to him. Got the first side of the mink all dried off. As lovely as mink fur is, muskrat fur is even nicer in my opinion. Not what you'd expect from a swamp dwelling rodent of unusual size. Equally surprising is how good their meat is. Muskrat meat is delicious. So with the fur all dry, I'm going to turn her back inside out. And that's just to let the actual flesh itself dry out and this next part's a little optional if you want a super soft hide once the flesh side is just barely damp to the touch you can apply a coat just a thin layer of oil of your choice i use a mixture of olive oil and beeswax um, because i have herbal salves i've made it's a good paste consistency so i just spread a thin layer of that and you want to do that while it's still just a little damp because if it's totally dry, it's going to soak up all that oil into one spot. And you don't need that much. By letting it be damp, that oil glides over the surface a little better. And as the water evaporates, it'll then draw that oil in. So it just helps you not over oil the hide and helps it all be even. That tree bark got rid of any mink smell too. Mink smell like ferrets. If you've ever been in somebody's house with a pet ferret, you probably know the smell. Let's get her turned back inside out. Our mink hide is mostly dry now. You can see anywhere that's dark is still just a little bit damp. Um, I really let this get a little too dry in some spots, but should be okay. What you could do is mist it with a little water in a squirt bottle. Give it a minute to soak in. I'd give it a nice even small amount of water just so that oil can travel. But I'm going to show you how to soften this. Now just like softening buckskin, you want to open up that leather. And you'll just get a little bit of stretch from a cased skin like this. The the wider spots will stretch more. Then you got thin little things like this you can hardly stretch. And uh, the great thing about bark tanned leather is it needs a really minimal amount of stretching. The bark really loosens everything up for you. It'll be a little bit stiff once it's dry out of the tan, but the easiest way to break the hide, that's what the stretching is called, is to just run it over an angled surface like this sawhorse that I'm sitting on. I am now doing this in the rain. Kind of ironic trying to dry something in the rain. So you can use your countertop, you can use a table, you can use a chair, anything. But you just want to rub it over an angled surface. If 
few times. Preferably a fairly clean one. This rain is actually rehydrating that hide. <laughs> that will immediately become much softer, much more floppy. You don't have to do much of it. Especially those thin little arm parts. Get those. This will also soften up the grain of the leather for you. So the surface will be a little more velvety. Here's another angled surface. It's a little bit cleaner. Ironically, it's cleaner because this is my fleshing beam. This is the stand for it, I mean. You got to do this stretching until it's bone dry. If you don't do it till bone dry, then it'll stiffen back up a little bit on you. You even hit the tail the same way too. All right, now this needs a little bit of oil. Here I've got some salve. This is just a mixture of olive oil and beeswax. And I infused some yarrow in the olive oil. That doesn't really play any part in this. Uh, I guess this has some pine resin in it too. Basically, all you need here is an oil. You can use lard, tallow, oils that are hard at room temperature like tallow. I've heard will stiffen a hide a little bit, make it denser. However, I have not experimented with that. And this is a fairly soft oil and it's what I generally use. It works really great and I love the smell of the finished product. I use this on my rabbit skins that I tan. A lot of this hides a little on the dry side to be applying oil, but it's going to be okay. It'll soak in and uh, provide more waterproofing. Luckily, the, thing's, the whole thing's not bone dry. So I'll rub this oil in. Careful not to get it on the fur much. I want that fur to be nice and clean. Once you have a good coating of oil, you're going to wring this hide. Twist it up, wring it push that oil through. This leather turned out very light colored. Lighter colored than when I've used willow in the past. Um, I think that is because in the past I've usually done a combination of willow and silver maple. Now silver maple is fairly low in tannins. It has um, a lot of dyes. When you boil a pot of silver maple bark, the resulting bark liquor is the color of coffee. It's like black coffee. With the willow maple mixture, I would get the beautiful rusty orange leather that you saw at the beginning of this video. You could also brain tan this at this point. To get the absolute softest product, you can bark tan, then a brain tan. Push that oil through. This is just how I do it. There's a lot of other tanners out there, and I don't know what methods they might use, but this is what works for me. Be somewhat careful, work that oil through. And as this dries, it'll soak in more and hopefully not be so oily. I oiled this more than I usually oil a fur. Do that same stretching. See how it goes white, or lighter colored at least. That's because you're opening up the sponge and all that oil just soaks further down. Really, that's just indicating that I have not over oiled this. Soaking back into that collagen structure that I'm opening up. Work that tail too. That tail's a little extra dense. Stretch this over your beam or your board or your countertop too. Neck is a little thicker. Man, they have a long neck. It's very surprising how well this that bark tanning solution gets rid of the musky mink smell. Really neutralizes those odors. You'll know when it's getting dry because it won't feel clammy anymore. This just feels really cool in my hands. It'll feel warmer, lighter, fluffier when it's dry. Now, I don't need to sit and stretch this the whole time. I can let it rest for a while, come back to it when it's a little more dry. You just need to catch it before it's bone dry, and then you can continue where you left off. All right, guys, this is it. It's finished. Here we are. It's nice and soft, plenty soft enough for what I need. You can see it's just even the arms, nice and soft. I hate living near an airport. So we'll turn it right side out now. Get a good look at it, and there you have it. This is how it should be when it's all finished. I'm really surprised how quickly I was able to have this tanned. This was only five or six days in the tanning solution. Only the one batch of solution. With the first boil and the second boil, that's all it took. If it's any less soft than this, you'll have a very hard time turning it right side out just because of how skinny of a tube it is. Good thing I softened it so much. If I were to leave this a little denser, then I'd have to let it dry with the fur side out. Goodness. Uh, getting some movement. Almost there. Man, but look at that fur. Got some of those white guard hairs. 
got that white spot. She is a beauty. That white patch is as white as the day I caught her. Okay. Here we are. <laughs> that just looks like a dead mink. There we go. Got the white chin patch. Got the whiskers. Now the last step would be to brush out this fur. You can use a hairbrush for that if you want. Um, they make specific fur brushes, too, that you can buy at trapping supply stores. But there's our mink. Beautiful female. Perfectly tanned. Just using tree bark. Even saves the white fur. Not a single white guard hair was stained because of the process. That is how you bark tan. Just using willow bark. There's all sorts of different trees you can use. Oak would do a lot faster. You can use less of it and still get a tan because oak is very high in tannins. That turned out perfect. Wow, I love how that turned out. That's how you take an animal fur and some tree bark and turn it into perfectly preserved leather. Most people have forgotten that this is one of the original ways tanning is done. Nature provides everything you need for it. Most trees have a good amount of tannins in their bark and a few have very high amounts that make your job a whole lot easier. You just scrape the hide, put it in the tanning solution, and it does the rest. It can be a stinky hide and it makes it smell good. And it preserves it so well that I could bury this in the ground and dig it up a year later, more or less intact. It wouldn't be nice by then, but tannins are a serious preservative. So I'll show you how those muskrats turn out. But for now, there's the mink hide. See you next time.